All right, everyone, welcome back for another weekly update of our sky tonight. And again, this is Seth Mayo, Curator of Astronomy for the Loman Planetarium at MOAS. And for this week, we're covering April 20th through April 26th. So hopefully get out there and take a look at the sky and explore the wonders of the universe as seen from planet Earth. So as you notice, we are looking in the western part of our sky towards the western horizon. And we'll watch the sunset here. And sunset this week is in the 7.55 time frame or so, give or take or minute or two, depending on the day of the week. But right around there uh, is sunset, just before 8 o'clock. So let's make that happen in here. We'll set our sun, and we'll go a little faster than that. Um, but we'll get that sun below the horizon. And we've talked about it a lot already. I kind of sound like a broken record here, but uh, you can still see in the west before it's totally dark out, this bright looking object right there, and that is still the planet Venus, second planet from the sun and the brightest planet seen from planet Earth here. Uh, Venus looks like a bright star that doesn't twinkle. So you've been talking about it a lot, but it's still worth mentioning. And even if people don't even realize they see Venus, a lot of people probably have seen it in the sky because of how bright it is. And so I want to mention it a lot, just so more and more people know that they're seeing another planet in the sky, which is always fun to find out, because that, that, that you're looking for that. So what's great about this week is uh, the moon will actually join Venus. So if I speed it ahead here to Friday, we will find that the crescent moon will join in, actually. So by Friday and Saturday, you'll see a very thin crescent uh, just above the setting sun. And then by Sunday, you'll see the moon, the very thin crescent moon still, and Venus next to each other. So that'll be a nice grouping or pairing going on there. And at this time, you'll see the moon, some of the night side of the moon right there. Uh, and that's called Earth shine. Have you ever noticed that? Kind of that darker portion is lit up just a little bit. That is actually from the Earth reflecting light from the sun back to the moon. Very cool effect. And so Earth shine happens, especially when the moon is a very thin crescent shape, as you'll see next to Venus at the end of this week. So that'll be nice. And we'll go back to earlier in the week here. And Venus is still stuck among these wintertime stars. Last week we mentioned that Venus is right next to or pretty close to Aldebaran, this reddish looking star at the end of its life, which is the eye of Taurus the bull, one of those zodiac signs, right? And at the back of the bull is the Pleiades or Seven Sisters star cluster right here that you can find there. And one thing I want to kind of say farewell to is not only Orion, which is nearby to the left of Venus here, there's Orion's belt shoulders, legs, and feet. But underneath Orion's belt is this little group of stars right there. This kind of uh, area right here, it uh, will look like a few stars now. With your own naked eyes, you probably won't see that many stars. Uh, what you'll realistically see is a fuzzball of light, and it's actually a nebula, a cloud of gas and dust called the Orion Nebula. And it turns out this is one of the most famous star-forming regions of our sky, one of the closest to us as well, at about 1,400 light years away. That means the light takes 1,400 years or so to travel from this area to reach us here uh, on planet Earth. That may seem like really far away, and it really is, um, but for a star-forming region, that's relatively close. So it makes it a very interesting place for us to study. New stars are being born inside of this. Uh, even new solar systems have been discovered, at least the beginnings of what could be new planetary systems around young stars have been found in this. Now, most likely you're going to see this through a telescope, right? You, you can't really see it uh, unless you're in a super dark place with your naked eyes. You might see, you know, kind of this sort of a little bit of a glow with your own eyes in a really, really, really dark place, but you will never see something like this. You definitely need a telescope to see that. And in a telescope, you'd see a bluish veil of gas around new stars. Uh, this, the view you see here is a very enhanced, very long exposed view of it, maybe with even some other wavelengths of light to kind of give you more detail here. 
And uh, some of the best pictures come from the Hubble Space Telescope, that orbiting observatory around the Earth. Uh, Hubble is actually celebrating its 30th anniversary this year, believe it or not. And uh, it's spent, or at least scientists have spent a lot of time focusing Hubble on this nebula to help us understand stellar evolution, how stars are born, how they live their lives, how uh, even new uh, planets are formed, all of that in this area. So it's a very rich area of research for the astronomy community. It's great and relatively easy to spot uh, in our sky underneath Orion's belt here. This is supposed to be the tip of the sword of Orion's belt, the Orion Nebula here. So if you think of Orion as a hunter, as he is from Greek mythology, here's uh, the outline of Orion. Here's the picture. His belt would be hanging off, or his sword would be hanging off his belt, and at the tip of that sword is uh, the Orion Nebula right there. So it's relatively easy to find in the sky. So it's getting kind of low. I want to mention that nebula before it uh, kind of falls closer to the sun's glare in the west. Now, since we're still in the springtime, I definitely have to mention all those spring stars, especially something overhead in the 8 o'clock, close to 9 o'clock time frame of this, this week, really high up near the zenith, which is the point in the sky that's straight up above you. You'll find these stars, especially these stars that look like a hook like shape right here that is the head this is the body and the tail of leo the lion there is the outline here of course is the picture of leo who fought hercules in these ancient stories hercules in a lot of the pictures you see of hercules he's wearing an animal pelt animal skin and usually that pelt is a lion it's supposed to be leo he fought this lion in one of hercules is a uh, 12 labors, these challenges, these, these things he had to overcome to clear his name of past wrongdoing. And Leo is one of his 12 labors. And so he wrestled him to the ground in one of those stories. So there is Leo kind of way up in the sky. And actually following Leo are two very bright stars at this time of year. You can see rising out of the east. This is Arcturus, uh, part of Boötes the Herdsman. And Arcturus is the fourth brightest star in the sky, uh, really noticeable, and not far from it is a star called Spica, right here. This star Spica is part of Virgo the Maiden, and not as bright as Arcturus, but Spica is a binary star, two stars orbiting around each other, so it's quite interesting. And the stars are kind of funny egg-shaped like, because they're so close, they gravitationally influence each other and kind of warp each other, the stars and uh, create these sort of egg-shaped uh, stars uh, of uh, Spica. And so those two stars are quite nice. And if you want to find them, especially Arcturus, you can use a really famous shape right here. You might know this. This is the Big Dipper, right? Here's the handle. There's the bowl, which we call an asterism, not as formal as a constellation. And what a lot of people do is you can arc with the handle. So what you can say is you can arc to Arcturus and then spike to spica, like that. So arc to Arcturus, spike to spica, and uh, in the astronomy community, we like to use these kind of fun memory tools to remember the, the sky, navigate the sky in kind of silly ways. And so that kind of works. Uh, the Big Dipper can be used to find a couple other interesting stars as well, right? So if you go to the bowl of the Big Dipper, or the inner part of the bowl, these two stars, if you point towards the zenith, that will lead you to one of the stars in Leo called Regulus. That's the brightest star in Leo at the end of the kind of backwards question mark hook-like shape. Regulus is a quadruple star system and very well known for the spring as well. So you can use the Big Dipper to find that. And even more famous, the Big Dipper's bowl, these two stars at the end of the bowl, can point you all the way to this star. And you may know what star that is because, hey, there it is. That's the north, so that's the north star, if I can click on it here. North star, which is also known as Polaris, because our north pole points to that star in space. And here's the handle of Little Dipper and the bowl. So the north star is part of the Little Dipper in the northern part of our sky. So this is a good time of year to see the Big Dipper, at least for us northern hemisphere dwellers. It's pretty high up in the northeast once it's dark out. So 
nice to see it high up in the sky. Now we're going to speed up time to real early in the morning, and there's a few things to really take note of if you get up real early, you know, kind of after midnight. So we'll go through 10, 11, 12, and as we get into the early morning hours, we're starting to see some summertime stars here. And uh, a pretty famous summertime asterism is called the Summer Triangle that we can see rising in the east. See these four stars, star, sorry, three stars uh, right here. These three stars here make up the Summer Triangle. And the brightest of the triangle of the corners is the star Vega, which is part of a very tiny little constellation called Lyra the Harp. Looks like a little par parallelogram right here. So I can draw Lyra the Harp, the stringed instrument. The reason I wanted to mention this little constellation is right next to it is uh, the peak of a meteor shower, a lesser known meteor shower called the Lyrid meteor shower named after Lyra the Harp. And meteor showers are when you have an outburst of bits of ice and rock and dust from the debris or the, the trail of a comet or asteroid that leaves behind stuff in space. Earth sometimes rams into that stuff, and that stuff can enter our atmosphere as falling debris, burn up, create these streaks of light in the sky, sometimes called shooting stars, but we usually uh, call them meteors, and they can happen in a certain location in the sky and a certain time of year. So every April, we have the Lyrid meteor shower. It's not the best and most, uh, the biggest meteor shower of all. It's usually, you can see about 10 to 15 meteors per hour. Um, but the peak of it is actually in the morning of the 22nd. Uh, and it happens throughout the week, but the technically the peak is the morning of the 22nd. And where to look, you don't have to look exact in this area. But what you do have in this area is something called the radiant. And that is the location where the meteors will radiate outwards from. So if you trace the meteors uh, this week, a lot of them will uh, come from this area near the radiant here. So it's in this location near Lyra the Harp within this area. Again, that's where the name Lyrid meteor shower. Again, not the biggest meteor shower. Uh, that you can find. The beginning of, of the year is a very quiet time for meteor showers. The second half of the year is usually better. But uh, this one's still worth trying out if you, you want to get up real late. It's better to look at it late because the peak of it's actually in the 2 o'clock time frame on the 22nd. So uh, stay tuned for possibly a few meteors in the sky from the Lyrid meteor showers. That's nice. And if you're observing meteors and you're up real early or real late, uh, get up uh, in the four to six o'clock time frame. I know it's really early, but before sunrise, uh, between four and six, look towards the southeast and you may catch a glimpse of three planets. They've been really close, kind of dancing around each other in the sky right here. Here they are, they're gonna look like non-twinkling stars. We have the planet Mars glowing kind of a reddish color there. We're getting closer to Mars this year. That's kind of nice. Then we have Saturn, the beautiful ringed planet, and then Jupiter, the biggest planet in the solar system, all fairly close in the sky. Jupiter and Saturn are actually drifting away from Mars here, but uh, they're still relatively close in the sky this week in the early morning. So definitely take advantage of these sort of planetary lineups that are still going on. So that's kind of nice. Mars, Saturn, Jupiter in the east. And then if you're up early in the morning, you can watch the sun rise for about 6.53, just before 7 in the morning this week. So that's kind of nice, too. So we have gone through an entire night there from sunset to sunrise. And that concludes another session of our Sky Tonight. And thanks for tuning in once again. We're continuing this content uh, as we move forward, uh, and not only are we putting out this great astronomy content, but all sorts of content from our curatorial department and from education and from many parts of our museum. Uh, we're seeing so much great content, so thanks for tuning in. Thanks for exploring the universe and our world with us, and hope to see you again for another uh, tour of our night sky. Take care. Happy stargazing.